Live from Case at 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A change of heart today from Texas Governor Greg Abbott. He is now issuing his own mask mandate for all public spaces in counties with 20 or more positive COVID-19 cases. Here in Bear County, we are well about that with 12,878 cases. That's an increase of 374 new cases since yesterday. Mayor Ron Nirenberg gave the latest numbers at a press briefing today about hospital capacity. There are also four new deaths tonight. The death toll now sits at 115. When breaking down those new numbers, 1,074 people are hospitalized tonight with 332 in the ICU and 180 on ventilators. Mayor Nuremberg says today marks the first time the amount of ventilators available has dropped below 400. The mayor also spoke about EMS calls. He says on average, when the pandemic began, there were around 20 COVID-19 related calls. Just yesterday, they reported 101 calls and 61 transports. Meanwhile, a cry for help. Today, hospital officials stood alongside city and county leaders begging the public to stay home and head, heed safety warnings this 4th of July weekend. They're hoping to prevent another spike in cases like the one seen two weeks after Memorial Day. If you do host a celebration, officials are asking that you keep it within your household preferably outdoors for ventilation purposes. Large gatherings of more than 10 people are discouraged. Even with family only, officials warn not to have a large spread of food or share utensils. These warnings come as 87% of local hospital beds are now occupied. Local leaders say it is up to all of us to prevent the hospitals from becoming overwhelmed. We need to work together today more than ever in a way that doesn't congregate us. We have over 9,000 healthcare workers at University Health System, each and every one of them on the front lines, whether they work at a clinic or at the hospital. They're there for you, whether it's a trauma need, whether it's a medical need, whether it's COVID, but they need you to back them up by not getting sick. Hundreds of nurses now coming from out of town to help local patients battling COVID-19. Now a look inside a place where more and more San Antonians are ending up, but fewer, where fewer and fewer beds are available, the hospital. Methodist Hospital opened its COVID unit to cameras, and Ursula Perry says the scenes vividly show us why we should be concerned. Everyone good? The patient isn't 50 or 60. These are the lungs of a 29-year-old badly damaged by the coronavirus. We are having an explosion of COVID. We aren't overrun yet, but it's overwhelming. Overwhelming now, but after the 4th of July holiday weekend, it's expected to be much worse. This is one of three Methodist Hospital COVID units. It has room for 14 patients and it's at capacity. Each room sealed, so simple PPE gear can help keep the staff safe. At this point, they have a waiting list to get in. To avoid using damaging ventilators, staff is using ECMO instead, a procedure to oxygenate the blood. Doctors insert large tubes into the veins of this 33-year-old through the groin to the heart. The blood comes out of the body, is mechanically oxygenated, and then returned back to the heart almost immediately. The blood coming out of the patient is dark. The blood coming back in, bright red, loaded up with oxygen. Almost immediately, levels in the patient's blood go back to normal, and there's a much better survival rate than if they were on a ventilator. However, there are still some medical mysteries to be solved. We don't quite understand why one person um, with lab values of X does well, while a person with lab values that appear to be better doesn't make it. Another thing that Methodist Hospital is doing is getting patients up and walking sooner. They believe that helps with the recovery, but also possibly can help their mood since they've been stressed out from being isolated. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Gunned down in his vehicle just over a year ago, the Crime Stoppers reward for George Ramos's killer now increased. In addition to the usual $5,000 offered, his family raising an additional $6,000. Jesse Degollado tells us they hope to do the same in the future for other families as a tribute to the young boxer with a promising career. The victim's white expedition and the suspect's red four-door vehicle are quite visible. 
Yet the blurry image of the alleged killer and any details might come into sharper focus now that Crime Stoppers is offering an $11,000 guaranteed reward for any information to help find who fatally shot George Ramos, a well-known young professional boxer. Just a small, minor thing. It might be exactly what investigators need. Ramos's large yet tight-knit family have gone so far as to boost the reward with a plate sale on the anniversary of his death. They say $6,000 was raised thanks to the support of friends, family, and local businesses, some who'd sponsored the boxer known as Lil G, the pride of San Antonio. We did not expect it to be as big as it was, um, and we are thankful, and we are uh, blessed, and, and we are beyond, beyond grateful. Yet his family isn't stopping there. This was the first of more fundraisers still to come to benefit other Crime Stopper rewards. Today it's us that needs the help, but we know that tomorrow or the next day, it'll be another family. And we know that we would not only be doing a good thing for ourselves and our community, but we would be, ma be making Georgie proud. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. If you think you know something about last year's murder of George Ramos, then call Crime Stoppers, their number 210-224-STOP. If you know, if what you know leads to an arrest, the $11,000 reward is guaranteed. Well, it is a first for Bear County. Dr. K Kimberly Molina has been appointed as the first woman to serve as the Bear County Medical Examiner. Paul Venema visited with her about that and about the challenges ahead for her. Good job. We got a motion and a second for approval. All those in favor will say aye. In a unanimous vote, county commissioners followed the recommendation of Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Randall Frost. I do not believe you could find a, a more competent, honest, impartial, and uh, dedicated person for this position. He's talking about Dr. Kimberly Molina. She served with Dr. Frost for 17 years and takes over next Tuesday. Certainly uh, having a much smoother transition not during a period of COVID would have been desirable. <laughs> But it, it didn't it didn't work out that way. So we're going to deal with it. That means making operational adjustments from staffing to workspace. That is the main challenge. And once we get past that, then I guess I'll be able to to look at other things. Dr. Molina is the fifth chief medical examiner in Bear County. She's making history as the first woman to hold the job. Are we making too much of that? Is that really not that big a deal? I won't be the one to judge that. <laughs> Her humility is also apparent as we discuss another part of her job, testifying in court. From our experience personally, that's never been a favorite part of, of your job. <laughs> that is true. I don't actually enjoy um, cameras. I don't enjoy the limelight. That may change as a result of the pandemic. I'm not even sure what it's going to look like when the courts return. Is our testimony going to move to more video testimony? Molina said that her predecessors, Dr. Frost and Dr. Vincent DeMaio, have made a difference as she moves forward. They've built the, the groundwork, and all I have to do is maintain it. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. A 25-year-old man whose body was found wrapped in a blanket on the southeast side over the weekend, now identified as Sean Michael Gaetan. The victim's body discovered on the side of the road last Saturday at the intersection of Casillas Road and Hildebrand. Little information known right now, but the Bear County Medical Examiner did confirm the victim suffered trauma to the head. Two suspects are now identified in connection with the disappearance of Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen. She's been missing since April. During the press conference, Fort Hood officials say they have in custody a civilian and soldier Aaron David Robinson of Illinois. The civilian was only identified as the estranged wife of a former Fort Hood soldier. An attorney for the family says her death was a result of sexual harassment. However, officials say they don't have any evidence to prove this is true. Our contact with the family have never been involved false information. And I am really sorry that I was not able to provide them information sufficient to reduce their suffering. I can't imagine what they're going through. Human remains were found near Leon River in Bell County that the Guillen family believes are hers. Fort Hood officials say they are expediting the identification of the remains. 
From access to health care, education, and poverty, this week's episode of our weekly digital program, KSAT Explains, focuses on the uneven impact the pandemic has had here in San Antonio. Nothing highlighted our, econo our city's economic problems more than a San Antonio Food Bank mega distribution event back in April. Many of the people waiting in those long lines for hours for food had just lost their jobs. In the COVID-19 environment, the, the collapse of those industries have displaced so many people now that are coming to get food. Um, and they were like, man, I was, I was good. They were just above the poverty line but not far enough above, literally that paycheck away from a crisis. Eric Cooper said in a matter of weeks, the food bank went from feeding 60,000 people a week to 120,000. He also shared with us a little bit of hope he is feeling right now. KSAT explains the uneven impact of COVID-19 part one, right now available on KSAT TV app, available on Roku, Fire Stick, and most other smart TV devices. You can also watch it at ksat.com slash explains. The Texas Health and Human Services Commission will provide around $182 million for the Emergency Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, also known as SNAP. Governor Abbott made the announcement today. The, addition, the additional funds will go towards July recipients. More than 950,000 SNAP households will see the additional amount on their Lone Star card by July 11th. This emergency July allotment is in addition to more than $600 million in benefits previously provided in the last three months. The San Antonio River Authority is temporarily closing some of its parks along with some large gathering areas along the river to help reduce crowds and stop the spread of COVID-19. These include Confluence Park on West Mitchell Street, portions of the Mission Reach section of the San Antonio Riverwalk, and River Crossing Park on South Loop 1604. All of those will be closed. Hike and bike trails along Museum Reach and Mission Reach will, however, remain open. We have a full list of park closures for these, this 4th of July weekend in San Antonio and Bear County. Just head to our website for that, ksat.com. And today the aquifer took another hit, down nearly half a foot to 660.4. So we're nearing that critical 660 level. Whereas if we're below 660 for rolling 10 day average, that's when stage one restrictions are enacted. And we're getting close to it, so we'll keep you updated. We could use some rain. Take a look at the pollen count here. We'll start with grass on the low end, pigweed mold all low. Dust was picked up on the slide today and it is elevating in its concentration as well. And you can see that dust in the air outside today, 97 degrees at the moment. We'll still be in the 90s at sunset, a hazy sunset by 10 p.m., 88 degrees, then increasing clouds tonight. I wish I could say they'd lead to some showers, but a few locations got lucky last night. We'll show you that. Talk about the dust, the weekend forecast, the heat, everything coming up, Tim. So Adam's still ahead at six. A local military couple's wish list fulfilled with a free shopping spree. Why they were selected for the gift. And coming up, her long locks are gone, but off to serve a better purpose. The inspiration behind why one local woman decided to donate her hair to cancer patients. A local military couple got a $1,000 shopping spree at Academy Sports and Outdoors. Michael and April Laggy were selected to receive the free gift as a way for Academy to show appreciation for their service. Michael has served, ex, uh, su suffered extensive injuries in an IED explosion, and April suffers from a spinal injury. The couple participates in adaptive sports and created a wish list of items that they wanted from Academy. Today, they got to pick up their items, and the couple says they are thankful for the kind gesture. Jeff at Wish for Our Heroes, we want to thank Hannah from Corporate Office, Academy. We want to thank the workers and Andrew here at the, this particular Academy store for pulling the items. And we want to thank everybody for uh, recognizing us veterans. That couple met while recovering from their injuries at Fort Sam Houston. 
Well, turning now to weather, a very steamy 97 degrees out there. Oh boy, today yeah. is hot. Feels like 4th of yes. July weekend, Adam. Yeah, right? <laughs> Welcome to July in yeah. South Texas. Here we go. And here's another indication that it's July. We're starting to see our drought expand a bit. Let's get right to the latest drought monitor. And at 5 o'clock, I showed you just our viewing area. And I'll show you that again and give you a, a comparison to last week coming up next half hour. But I want to show you the entire state. Now, we have seen the drought expand along the border, basically rock springs toward Uvalde to Del Rio Eagle Pass. But it's much worse as you head north and you get up into the panhandle. Now, 28% of Texas is considered in drought and three months ago, 20%. So clearly we've fallen deeper into drought with a lack of rain over the past several weeks. The last night, some folks got fortunate. I'll share that with you in a moment. All right, let's talk about the African dust. It's obvious out there right now. We have that extra haze in the air and latest indications are now that this is gonna stick around through tomorrow and the entire upcoming weekend. This is Friday, 2 p.m., still pretty thick. We get into Saturday, still very noticeable, and then same story as we get into Sunday. So the most recent indications are that this is going to be through the weekend and then start to dissipate a little bit as we get into Monday. So this is a time lapse of our sky. It looks like we have an overcast, low clouds, but no, not even a cloud out there. That's just the haze that's shrouding out the sunlight, the dust from the Saharan air layer. Started the day at 80 degrees. That ties the record for the warmest low temperature. Our high temperature, 99. Oh, so close to our first 100 degree day, but we didn't do it today. The record, by the way, 106. Right now, at Randolph, it's 96, along with Pleasanton, 99 in Helotus. Bernie area at 91, 95 in Bandera. Hondo, you're 98 degrees, along with New Braunfels. And we're right at the century mark in Uvalde and Del Rio and a little bit warmer than 100 southwest of town. So we're feeling the heat, not as humid. That's the key, and that's why the temperatures are a little bit warmer today than what we had yesterday, because the, when the air is drier, as it sometimes happens in the afternoon, it warms up more efficiently. So the real thick humidity is confined to the coastline and the Gulf, and basically the coastal plain, whereas through the night, our dew points will be climbing, and it's gonna be thick humidity again, just a handful of hours after sunset. All right, I mentioned some folks got uh, lucky with some rainfall last night between about 9 p.m. and then sunrise this morning, especially right along Highway 90 near Langtree in Valverde County, along the I-10 corridor in Sutton County, and even parts of Kerr and Real counties had some decent rainfall. Here's a look at the satellite and radar imagery from that. A lot of it started to fall apart gradually, but luckily it took its time falling apart, and some folks were able to... Uh, be fortunate and tap into some of the leftover showers that were previously over San Angelo. However, the upper level high, it's starting to control our weather a little bit more. It's not a huge dominating heat high, but it's making its presence known. And yeah, there have been some showers along the periphery of it, but our rain chances are very slim here the next couple of days. So let's start with tomorrow, 78 in the morning. 90 at noon, then right up near 100 again for the high temperature. Other than some morning clouds, we'll have that hazy sunshine the rest of the day. And that's going to be the case through Saturday and Sunday. That hazy dust still overhead. If you're sensitive to the dust, whether it be your respiratory system or even allergies, anticipated here through Sunday. And we're forecasting our first triple digits this weekend, maybe even a degree or two warmer. Then we get into Monday, and that's our first chance of some isolated pop up showers, but don't hold your breath. It's a very limited chance there, but hey, it's better than nothing. We may see a few pop up showers as we get into next week. Very true. Thank you so much, Adam. DeMar DeRozan has a much to think about, Larry, and had a lot to read, too. Every NBA player got a 113-page memo from the NBA detailing life inside the bubbles, the do's, and a whole lot of don'ts, including you can't play doubles ping pong. We got more on that. Plus, Jimbo Fisher and the Aggies received a punishment today. Coming up. The nose test is kind of kind of tricky to bring a couple ears, a couple tears down your eyes. Um, but everything else, not too bad. Tomorrow, the Spurs are going through regular COVID-19 testing as they get ready to head to Orlando and Big Board Sports.
Individual workouts are now mandatory for the Spurs and the rest of the NBA as the league continues in its drive to resume the season in Orlando later this month. The NBA broke it down into six phases and is currently in phase three, which states in part mandatory workouts. Workouts are mandatory. Players and staff are expected to continue following quarantine rules and regular COVID-19 testing will continue. During this phase, teams will confirm their traveling party and make their way to Orlando either by bus or charter plane between July 7th and July 9th. In order to prep teams for Orlando, the NBA sent a 113 page memo to its players detailing life in the bubble. One rule states no doubles ping pong allowed so players can maintain six feet of distance from each other. DeMar was asked about that during a Zoom session with the media this morning. The ping pong thing is, like you said, it's ridiculous. I'm, let's be honest, like, guys can't do this, but we can do this and, and battle over each other. You know, it's, that part just don't make no sense to me. And, and I got through 10, 10, 10, 10 lines of, of the handbook and just put it down because it becomes so frustrating and overwhelming at times because you just never thought you'll be in a situation such as something like this. So, you know, it's hard. It's hard to process at times. DeMar said he hasn't played video games since he was 16 and he will find some other ways to self educate while inside the Orlando bubble. Last time we saw center Jakob Pertl on the court was February 29th against Orlando when he suffered a right MCL sprain. He missed the Spurs next five games and then the season was put on hold. Jakob told the media today that his knee feels great, is 100%. He hasn't had any issues with it for the last month or two. Life in the bubble is going to be a bit boring at times, so he was asked how he's going to deal with it. I mean, I'd like to think I've... I've practiced it for the last three months, so um, hopefully it's not going to be too tough. Um, for me personally, um, I think I'm going to be fine with it. I'm pretty good at being on my own. I, I live by myself. Uh, I I play my video games. I, I FaceTime my friends, so I I have I have ways to pass the time. Um, like I said, I don't think it's going to be the the most fun, um, but um, it's a sacrifice. Hopefully, everybody's willing to make. Jakob was rocking a serious mustache during quarantine, but now it's gone. He said that was his quarantine look, and it's time to get back to business. The Spurs are scheduled to leave for Orlando July 9th. During his third season with the Aggies, head football coach Jimbo Fisher was given a six-month show cause order, and the team was placed on probation for a year after Fisher and the program were found to have violated NCAA recruiting and athletic-related activity rules. According to ESPN, the findings stem from violations that allegedly occurred between January 2018 and February 2019. The allegations include an incident in which Fisher and an assistant coach had impermissible contact with a recruit. The NCAA also found football players exceeded activity time limits by about seven hours for multiple weeks during the spring and summer of 2018. Got to the follow the rules, can't break the rules. Indeed. Thanks, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back. Time now for our KSAT Q&A, and we have a lot to talk about in terms of the coronavirus. Joining us this evening is Dr. Ruth Berggren from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health. As always, thank you, Dr. Berggren, for joining us. I want to get right to talking about these hospitalization numbers. Um, earlier in the day, the statistic we saw was something like 87% full across the city. What can you tell us about the current capacity and where we're headed? Right, so we've been seeing an increase of 10% per day for quite a while now. And at that rate, you know, you double every seven days. And um, we thought that our capacity for COVID patients was gonna be about 1400 and then we'd be um, needing to do extraordinary measures such as open up beds that we don't usually use or even go to other sites. And we are just about at capacity right now because of the increase in 10% per day. We are trying to use the brick and mortar hospitals that we have as the places to care for people, but it's requiring that we do things like use pediatric intensive care units for adults, use post-surgical care areas uh, as ICUs, and use rehabilitation wards for regular patients to make more room for the COVID patients. That's what's going on right now. 
And doctor, the other big thing that came out today, uh, Governor Greg Abbott uh, changing his mind on masks. He's now making them mandatory in all counties that have at least 20 positive COVID-19 cases. A big change for the governor. Your reaction to that and then your message to folks who still are politicizing this and deciding that they don't need to wear a mask. Your message to them. I think this is a wonderful move. Congratulations, Governor Abbott. Thank you so much. This is what we need. People respond to leadership and we need leadership in this area. I'm actually part of a large coalition of doctors in Texas. And uh, last weekend, uh, a group of us representing 8,000 doctors from the American College of Physicians joined with another 11,000 physicians from North Texas signing a letter to Governor Abbott asking for mandatory masking. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what he was responding to, but people should know that your doctors think this is a really good idea. And we did ask our governor to do this. So let's get on it and let's wear the mask. Touching really quickly on testing, I think by now we all know or probably know of someone who has tested positive in our lives. Um, who should be getting a test? Um, can you talk to us about, you know, there's still being a shortage. Um, people are still having a hard time getting those tests. Who should be the ones going out and getting them? First and foremost, it's people with the symptoms that you've heard about, particularly anybody with a fever over 100 or the cough um, and the body aches that you've been hearing about. But in addition, people who have been exposed to somebody else that is known to have COVID may need to get that test to understand what they should be doing. But if you do, if you go get a test because of an exposure, the best time to get the test is either when you have the symptoms or you've reached the eighth day after the exposure. And that may seem a little weird to people, but it's based on data that show that your best chance of having that test be a true positive or not being a false negative is on the eighth day after your exposure. And just sticking with testing here real quick, uh, we've seen a lot of people here locally getting tested as we've seen the cases skyrocket. I tried to go uh, two weeks ago on a Saturday to a walk up place and the line was seriously about a half mile long. What concerns do you have when it comes to testing capacity? Well, you know, first of all, when you're in a long line like that, remember the social distancing, the vast majority, I think, of people going to get tested nowadays are people who have symptoms. So if you're there and there's a line, you know, make sure you've got your mask on and, and you're staying far apart. That's my first concern. Um, secondarily is um, we have increased our testing capacity in this city. I don't think that that's going to be our main problem. My concern is whether we make use of the information. So I want to remind everybody that if they get a phone call from 210-207 prefix, that is probably a contact tracer who's calling you up either because you're positive or you've been exposed to somebody who's positive and they've got really important information for you or they need information from you. So my concern about testing is once you have the information, do the right thing and communicate it to others. Be proactive, certainly. Thank you so much, Dr. Berger, and we hope to talk to you again during the night beat tonight at 10. Thank you. Thank you, we'll be right back. A Jordanton woman looking to celebrate being cancer free for 25 years decided she wanted to pay it forward by donating her hair to someone in the middle of their cancer fight. She recently posted her plans on Facebook in hopes of finding a recipient. And as Stephanie Cerner reports, that Facebook post led her to a local teacher who just finished six weeks of chemotherapy. Jill Watts Foster was diagnosed in March of 1995 with breast cancer, but after 12 rounds of chemotherapy, she beat cancer. And this being 25 years, kind of an anniversary date per se, this is the year that I want to pay it forward. You ready? Jill decided to pay it forward by cutting 10 inches of her hair and donating it. She has so much hair. Jill's donation will now be going to Lisa Shelton, who was recently diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor. She's a teacher paying it forward to teaching kids and she's devoted her life to that. I would love to do this for her. Jill and Lisa met through a mutual friend who saw Jill's post on Facebook about her plans to donate her hair. I'm blessed to be able to have met her now and I haven't had a chance to give her a hug yet. Lisa had part of the brain tumor removed on April 16th and went through six weeks of chemotherapy. 
Lisa tells us she was blessed to get through that and to be able to continue to exercise thanks to the support of her family and friends. I was able during the six weeks to still work out. Of course, not at the same level, but I was still able to bike ride and to run and to walk and to you know, be with my friends and family and to do those things. She's being very modest. She would be on her fourth week of chemo and radiation and she'll be biking 10 miles and doing like 160 burpees and crunches. As Lisa's fight continues, her new friend Jill is hoping someone can help with her donation there it is. by making a wig at no cost. Perfect. Stephanie Serna, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a live look outside with live cam. Very hazy, very hot out there, Adam. Yeah, and that haze is uh, mostly due to the African dust back in the air today, and we'll talk about that in more detail again coming up in a few minutes. You know, today we topped out at 99 here in San Antonio. We have yet to hit 100, but it's looking more likely over the next couple of days. Uvalde hit 100, Carrizo Springs 106, New Braunfels at the century mark earlier today for high temperatures. We'll be back to talk more about the weekend heat for your holiday weekend forecast, the dust that's in the air, the latest drought monitor and who actually had rain last night coming up. The coronavirus pandemic has left assisted living facility residents especially isolated as visitor access remains shut down. Senior care facilities in North Carolina is using social media to get pen pals for their residents. It took just one question for the post on Facebook to go viral. Will you be my pen pal? Residents smiled for pictures while holding signs with their names and interests. Mail and packages poured in from across the globe. Well, Walmart is transforming 160 of its store parking lots into drive-in theaters starting in August. Amid the pandemic, drive-in theaters have been making a comeback. Walmart is partnering with Tribeca Enterprises for the films. Locations and movie titles have not been announced yet. Walmart says the family-friendly nights will include hit movies, special appearances from filmmakers and celebrities, and concessions delivered directly to customer vehicles. Well, the truth is out there, and today may be the perfect day to find it because it's World UFO Day. This is video of Area 51, which has long been a topic of fa fascination for conspiracy theorists and paranormal enthusiasts who believe it to be the location where the U.S. government stores and hides alien bodies and UFOs. That's just one of the sites, allegedly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> People can recognize the day by watching UFO movies and chatting with friends about the possibility of alien life. I'll have to go home and watch some ancient aliens on History yes. Channel tonight. <laughs> Turning now to weather, uh, Fourth of July weekend is yeah. upon us. Yeah. And yeah, Independence Day, another good alien movie. <laughs> there you go. I was just waiting for Tim to chime in with the real Tim Gerber opinion on all of this. It's always worth worth waiting and listening for. You gave us a little taste of it. I know. I see. Uh, I save it for off air. Yeah. There yeah. We go. <laughs> all right. Let's chat about the latest drought monitor. It is in. Now, I want to start with last week's because I want to give you something to compare to. And notice how we have the expanded dry area west of San Antonio. That was last week. Here we go. Three, two, one. And boom, this week, notice how that dry area expanded more and also the area of moderate drought in that light brown color. So unfortunately, with the dry pattern we've been in, we are seeing the drought expand a bit more week by week. Here's some good news though. We did see some downpours last night, west and northwest of San Antonio, roughly between about 10 p.m. and then sunrise. They hit parts of Sutton County, Edwards County, Real County, made it to Kerr County and really dissipated. And then we saw some action where we really need the rainfall in Valverde County. So that's at least a nice little glimmer of hope there and a piece of good news. Right, look at this. Normally this is a nice clear shot. You can see the sun nicely. Look how shrouded out it is in the haze. It almost looks like we have a thin overcast and a veil of cirrus clouds. That's not the case. We've got the dust back in town and latest indications are this is going to stick around. So look at our computer model here for the African dust and it's basically going to stay overhead and be noticeable through tomorrow. This is 2 p.m. Then again on Saturday, it could briefly thicken up a little bit more and still linger around on Sunday. One of the problems is we have the big blue H that's just going to be sitting on us. So we're not going to have the real movement of the air to get it out of here and really disperse it until most likely the early part of next week on Monday.
Dallas really stands out right now at 79 degrees. Some rain cooled air there. Even 80 in Amarillo, they had some showers up in the panhandle and they could really use the rainfall even more than us down here in South Texas. But right now, Del Rio's a century mark, Laredo 103 and Carrizo Springs at 104, the current reading. And it's going to be very similar to this, but probably a degree or two higher over the next couple of days and through the holiday weekend. One reason why temperatures are up a little bit now compared to yesterday is that the dew points, they've dropped a little bit in the afternoon. Sometimes we get the drier air aloft that mixes down, especially with the dust in place. It's drier air aloft, but the drier air heats up more efficiently, and so we see those warmer readings. So tomorrow, we'll be right near 100 again. I wouldn't be surprised if we hit it for the first time this year. We'll start the day at 78. By noon, we'll be at 90, and then right up near 100, hazy, hot, and humid for most of the day with that south-southeasterly wind at 5 to 10. Hazy dust, it hangs around. Saturday, 4th of July through Sunday we will also have the high heat with temperatures, I think, breaking 100 as we go through the weekend. And then as for rain chances, looking very slim. I mean, we're talking a 20% chance by Monday of next week. Overall, not a whole lot of hope in terms of good rainfall anytime soon. But at least we're going to see a shift in our pattern where we could have a few isolated pop-up showers or downpours as we get into next week. That's right. Welcome, Tim and Isis. You're here on a Thermometer <laughs> Thursday. So I have this to share with you, and I did wear the appropriate tie. So my good friend is a meteorologist in Denver. He's at the uh, uh, KMGH. It's the ABC affiliate there. And he sent me the thermometer I made for him. He sent it back because he said it endured a hailstorm and broke. Notice how you don't see any actual reading on that thermometer. It just looks like clear glass. Well, I can tell you the glass did not break from the hail. It's a different phenomenon that caused this to happen, which I will remedy. You can mull it over and think it over in your mind. I'm going to give you the answer as we get into next week and tell you what caused this and how to prevent it. But we do have a thermometer winner this week. Mike Walker of New Braunfels. Yes, recently moved to New Braunfels. Congratulations, Mike Walker. Your thermometer will not be broken like that. Yours will be in good <laughs> working order. Let's give Mike Walker a round of applause. This week's homemade thermometer winner. Congratulations. Yeah, Mike. you can go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing, by the way. Oh, shoot. We're not going to get the shot in. But I was going to say your um, tie and mask. Yeah, yeah, I've got, I've got both. On there point. we go. They yeah, match. there on it point. is. You yes. also get one of the... Uh, one of the Thermometer Thursday masks, huh? You should just make everything, you know, t-shirts and <laughs> shorts and... Have a whole store. And, yeah. All right, I want one of those you. koozies that you have. <laughs> oh, yeah, those two. <laughs> In case you missed it, it's coming up next. Well, if you would like to give back, consider giving your time by helping out Meals on Wheels. As this second wave continues, the nonprofit says they're in need of the help. They're looking for meal delivery drivers. Volunteers would work at the 10 a.m. hour, and all they need to do is come by and pick up the meals for delivery. Staff says at the beginning of the pandemic, they had plenty of volunteers, but over the last few months, it's died down. Uh, volunteers are the wheels of Meals on Wheels. We really need as many as we can absolutely get. Uh, we love having new faces roll through. We have about 100 routes every day that are going out, and half of those are filled by volunteers, and half of those right now are us because we still need some support. The only requirement to volunteer is to wear a mask, which will be provided if you don't have one. Staff says they urge volunteers to keep their distance while dropping off meals. Good way to help out. Mm -hmm. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. 
Governor Greg Abbott reversing course on his executive order, now mandating mandatory mask wearing for all counties with more than 20 positive cases. Those new orders coming down right before Mayor Ron Nuremberg and Judge Nelson Wolf and local hospital leaders came together to update us on current states of COVID-19 in Bear County hospitals. Today they announced another 374 cases of the coronavirus here in Bear County and another four deaths. So this Independence Day, we are depending on you to help stop the spread of this deadly virus. BCSO deputies now using a canine unit to find a third suspect involved in stealing a vehicle. Deputies tell us that three people picked up a vehicle that was stolen at gunpoint this morning. After leading deputies on a chase, the suspects got out, tried to run away in the 5100 block of Badland Beacon. Two out of the three suspects are now in police custody. U.S. officials provided a classified briefing for congressional leaders about intelligence assessments that Russia offered bounties for killing U.S. troops in Afghanistan. The meeting comes as President Donald Trump is under pressure to provide answers about the United States response. The CIA director, director of national intelligence, Senate Majority Leader and House Speaker were all in attendance. And a reminder for many people, 4th of July weekend begins tomorrow. That means closures. All city and county parks in Bexar County will be closed this weekend. The parks will reopen on Monday and meanwhile, the Padre Island National Seashore will close its beaches as well for the weekend. And you will not be able to enter Medina Lake Park or use the boat ramps until July 8th. Thanks so much for watching the news at six. We'll see you back here for the night beat tonight at 10.